I am Jane Goodall by Brad Meltzer. I am Jane Goodall. On my first birthday, my father bought me a cuddly toy chimpanzee named Jubilee. I loved Jubilee. I mean it, loved. I used to carry Jubilee with me everywhere. As I got older, when I'd line up all my toys and play teacher, Jubilee was the one who had his own chair. I didn't just love my toy chimpanzee though. I loved all animals, even the earthworms I found in the garden. My mum told me the worms would be safer in the garden, so we took them outside and buried them back in their home. At five years old, I was curious to learn how chickens lay eggs. So I crawled into my grandma's hen house to watch. At first, all the hens were scared of me. Then I decided to crouch in the corner. If I had moved, the hens would have run away. I was patient, though. Finally, after all the hours of waiting, I saw what I was looking for. The hen gave a little wiggle and plop, there was an egg. It was my first research project. In addition to animals, I also loved nature. I named the chestnut tree Nookie and the beech tree Beech. Beech was my favorite. Oh. That was another thing I loved, reading. Back then, my family didn't have a lot of money. To get books, we went to the library. When I was seven years old, I got a book that would change my life. It was called The Story of Dr. Doolittle. I read it once, then read it again, then read it a third time before it had to go back to the library. It was about a man who could talk to animals. In the book, there's a parrot who says that if you want to learn how animals talk, you need the power of observation. But what I remember most is the part where Dr. Doolittle and his animal friends are being chased and they come to a cliff. Right there, the monkeys join hands and feet. They became the bridge. Isn't that beautiful? We can accomplish anything by working together. After reading that book, I vowed that I would go to Africa and live among the animals. By the time I was 12, I had my own nature group, the Alligator Club. My friends and I raised money to help old horses. We took nature walks and wrote down what we saw, or at least I did. If you wanted to have a high rank in the club, you had to be able to recognize 10 dogs, 10 birds, 10 trees, 5 butterflies or moths. Was I the best student? <laughs> Not really. On school days, it was hard for me to wake up. I didn't like being indoors. If we were outside or there were animals around, that's when I'd get excited. I wanted a job where I could learn more about animals. But back then, if you were a girl, people didn't think you could become a scientist. They expected girls to become nurses, secretaries, teachers. I wanted to go to Africa. I wanted to study animals. Luckily, my mum always told me, if you really want something, work hard for it. If you don't give up, you'll find a way. I never forgot that. Soon I had my chance. One of my school friends invited me to visit her family in Kenya. To pay for the trip, I worked as a waitress and hid my money under the carpet. One day, I closed the curtains, counted it all, and... The trip took 21 days by boat. I was 23 years old. It all seemed like a dream until I saw a giraffe who was staring directly at me. It had dark eyes, long lashes, a black tongue, and it was chewing acacia thorns. I knew my dream was coming alive. Finally, I was in the Africa of Dr. Doolittle. Two months later, my life changed again. Someone told me, if you are interested in animals, you must meet Dr. Leakey. 
Dr. Leakey was an anthropologist, which means he studies how humans live, and also a paleontologist, which means he studied fossils and bones. At first, he hired me as a secretary, but he was quickly impressed when he knew what I knew about animals, including his own pets. Eventually, Dr. Leakey told me about a new job studying chimpanzees up close. He said going into the forest would be hard. It would be dangerous. But if we could find out how chimps live today, we'd learn more about how our own prehistoric ancestors used to live. For a year, I read everything I could about chimpanzees. I was also told that women couldn't be alone in the forest. They said I needed a guide plus a companion. My mum offered to come. I was ready. I'll never forget the day, July 16, 1960, the day I first set foot in what is today Gombe National Park in Tanzania, Africa. At 26 years old, I had finally made it to the home of chimpanzees. It was a place that would change my life. During one of my first explorations, we saw two chimpanzees eating in a tall tree. They noticed us, and then they ran away. The next day, we didn't see any chimps. There were no chimps the day after that, either. For months, I tried to get close, but they kept running away. Then I started going alone, just me. I'd go to a high area called the peak and look down with my binoculars. In time, I saw that chimpanzees would hang out in groups of six or fewer. The female chimps would be with the children. The male chimps would be with one another. These weren't mindless animals. This was a community. Still, it took nearly a year before I could get within 100 yards of the chimpanzees. One day, I came back to camp and found out one of the male chimpanzees had taken our food. The next day, I waited and waited. There were no chimpanzees in sight. Then, at 4pm, I heard a rustling noise by my tent. It was the large male chimpanzee with a thick beard. David Greybeard. That was the name I gave him. Back then, people told me there was a certain way to study animals, that I shouldn't give the chimpanzees names. They said animals were supposed to have numbers, not names. Why? Well, they thought animals didn't have personalities or emotions. They thought that if we give them names, we'd start pretending they were like us. But that's what no one realized. They were like us. That day, David Greybeard took my nuts and my bananas. A month later, he took one from my hand. Even later, out in the forest, he slowly approached me and checked to see if I had a banana in my pocket. It was one of my proudest moments. Having the other chimpanzees now understand that I wasn't a threat. I was their friend and they were mine. Over time, by seeing the chimpanzees as individuals, I could truly understand them. David was calm, though he liked getting what he wanted. Goliath was easily excited. William was shy. Old Flo was a strong mother, always bringing her daughter and son. As I watched, I learned one of the coolest things of all. One day, I saw David Greybeard stripping leaves from a twig, then sticking the twig into a termite mound. He wasn't just using the twig as a tool, he had made that tool. Before that, scientists thought only humans could make tools. There was no doubt now that these animals were intelligent. Every night, I'd write in my journal about what I observed. And every day, I saw the chimpanzees doing the same things we do. Holding hands, tickling, kissing, even patting backs to reassure each other. In my life, people told me there was a certain way to do things, a certain way to study animals, a certain way that girls should behave. They told me to follow the rules. Instead, I followed my gut. 
In your life, it will be easy to see how others are different from you. But there's so much more to gain if you instead see how alike we all are. All of us, all living things, share so much. We have so many things in common. When we realize that and look out for each other, that's the most beautiful way to live together. I am Jane Goodall, and I see so much that we have in common. Watch, observe, be patient. It will teach you this. We don't own this earth. We share it. Listen to the feelings in your heart. We are responsible for the animals around us. We must take care of them. When one of us is in trouble, be it human, creature, or nature itself, we must reach out and help. When we do, we build a bridge. A bridge that will carry all of us. You cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference. You have to decide what kind of difference you want to make.